Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Dean and Chapter, I welcome you warmly to Westminster Abbey and to the One People Oration. The phrase One People was coined by my predecessor, Edward Carpenter, who was Archdeacon in 1965 and later Dean of Westminster. And the orations commenced in 1966. 1965 was the 900th anniversary year of the consecration and dedication of St. Edward the Confessor's Church, the second on this site. It was a great service on the 28th of December, 1965, and then a whole year of celebrating one people. So the orations are intended to make people think not only of all Christian people, but of all mankind. And this oration is the highlight of Westminster Abbey Institute's autumn program. The Dean and Chapter founded the Institute in 2013 to revitalize moral and spiritual values in public life and service, working with our neighbors around Parliament Square, principally the Palace of Westminster, Whitehall, and the Supreme Court, but with others as well. The Institute concerns itself with the moral and spiritual courage and compass of public servants as individuals and also public service institutions. This autumn's program is entitled Democracy and is considering what serves and what threatens a healthy democracy. We are honored to have Sir John Major, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and respected commentator on our political people and institutions to give the one people oration this year. You have his biography, and in any case, he needs no introduction from me. Sir John has kindly agreed to respond to your questions and reactions on his oration at the end. So I'm delighted to invite Sir John to give the 2017 One People Oration. Please offer him the warmest of welcomes. Well, John, good evening and welcome everybody. As a boy in the 1950s, encouraged by two very impudent close friends, I cut my teeth as a public speaker on a soapbox across the river in Brixton Market. And in those early days, I guess none of my friends would have imagined that one day my soapbox would be upgraded to a lectern in this beautiful and historic abbey. Now, I doubt those years ago that I imparted very much wisdom from my Brixton soapbox. But I did learn about people. No one barracked. No one told me in Brixton Market, as surely they could have done, to go away and come back when I knew something about, well, anything. Even in a crowded and busy market, people took time to stop and listen or question. No one seemed to resent me or my views. No one was hostile, although many must have disagreed with what I said. And today, as politics has become more rancorous, I've often thought back to that time and wondered how we lost that tolerance of opposing views. Certainly, that tolerance was missing from the recent referendum campaign when honest and thoughtful political debate was from time to time abandoned in favor of exaggeration, half-truth, and untruth. And no one seemed either ashamed or embarrassed by this. Indeed, some reveled in it, which suggests that mendacity is acceptable, providing it panders to a popular prejudice. And then it's sanctioned by many who know it to be untrue and welcomed by others whose prejudices are supported by it. And if it's delivered with wit and panache, it may even be believed. Now, some of the media reported what was said, even when they must have known it to be improbable at best or untrue at worst. And in that way, the referendum showcased a deterioration in both the conduct and reporting of our politics. 
Now, there will be those, perhaps present this evening, for all I know, who think that my subject, the responsibilities of democracy, is inappropriate for Westminster Abbey, that it's a secular concern, and that the arts and practice of democratic politics are far removed from the higher concerns of the church. They are wrong, as wrong or as misguided as those that argue that the church should stay out of politics. It shouldn't. Both church and state care for the well-being of people, and if one institution is failing them, then the other has a duty to say so. Two-way constructive criticism, if conducted civilly, is healthy and no one should shrink from it. In uh, years gone by, the church was sometimes criticized as the Tory party at prayer. Today, it's often told it's too left-wing. I doubt the first was ever true, and the charge of left-wing bias is trotted out whenever the church talks about poverty. But the church should talk about poverty. So should we all. Poverty has never been the sole preserve of the left. Conservatives from Wilberforce to David Cameron, who made overseas aid to the very poorest a signature policy, have focused upon poverty. Now, on occasions such as this, there are two special kinds of lecture. One is uplifting and intellectual. It enlivens the conscience and leaves us pondering the higher purpose of man. My purpose is more prosaic. It's to provoke thought about democracy, both generally and in our own country. Democracy is very precious, but how is it performing in a new world that is changing at bewildering speed? Is it doing its job? Is it at risk? Where is it failing? What is its future? As I look around the world in many countries, I see a distaste for politics that runs very deep. That is a danger to democracy. So inevitably, my theme this evening, in part, is a cry for action where there is none and of warning where there is peril. What is democracy? It's surely more than electing a government through a universal franchise. Elections are an expression of democracy, but the ballot box alone is insufficient. President Putin wins elections. Is Russia a democracy? No, it's not. Is Turkey? Is Egypt? Even on the narrowest and meanest of definitions, the answer is no. Nor are many other countries that hold elections, sometimes rigged. But voting apart, they have few of the attributes of a genuine democracy. My worry, my concern, is that democracy is in retreat, stifled in part by its own virtues. Democracy operates on consent. That being so, it's slower to make decisions than autocracy or outright dictatorship. Democracy must cajole, must persuade, must seek consensus. Not so autocracy. And this can make autocracy seem much more efficient than democracy, more decisive, more able to deliver its promises, more swift to act in a time of crisis. The rise of non-democratic China to economic superstardom is one of the great stories of history, but there is a price to pay for her success, and that price is a lack of personal freedom for the masses. For now, no doubt countless millions of Chinese are grateful for the economic improvement. But human nature suggests that as their individual well-being grows, they will demand greater personal choice and liberty. And if that happens, when that happens, autocracy must yield or repress. And that choice lies ahead for many countries. At the heart of true democracy is liberty. Liberty under the law. Democratic government must be freely elected for a fixed period in a universal franchise untainted by coercion. There must be checks and balances to its authority. The rule of law must apply, even to the most powerful. 
The judiciary must be independent and there must be a free media, an independent academia and a functioning opposition free to oppose without sanctions. Only then can freedom of speech and action be protected. But these attributes, even these attributes, are merely the trappings of democracy. Democracy in action is more than satisfying the material demands of the majority or honoring the promises of an election manifesto. It seems to me that democratic government must govern for the future as well as the present. A governing party must govern for political opponents who did not vote for them and may never do so. It must govern for the unborn and the country they will inherit. It must govern for minorities, for the wider international community. And all governments have a responsibility to themselves for the manner in which they govern. One has only to set out these responsibilities to see that no government, perhaps ever, has met this ideal. Government by men and women, not saints, is an imperfect vehicle for perfection. But that doesn't mean their imperfections should be ignored or accepted. Yet today in parts of the world, they often are, as a disillusioned, disinterested, preoccupied, or in some cases a cowed or misled electorate, shrug their shoulders and turn away. In such a climate, there is a risk. And the risk is that democracy faces a threat from the rise of nationalism. This isn't a theoretical threat. In many countries, it's a reality. In others, it's a clear and present danger. In the democratic West, we have come to believe that our liberal, social, and economic model of democracy is unchallengeable. It is not. Last year, as the United Nations has reported, 67 countries suffered a decline in political and civil liberties, while only 36 had gains. What has happened there can happen elsewhere. Over 20 democracies have collapsed during the last two decades. And as we all know, there is widespread dissatisfaction in many others. Across Europe, our own backyard, nationalism has gained more than a foothold. It begins with a populism, a populism that masquerades as patriotism, but morphs into something far less attractive. In many countries, nationalist parties have significant support. They can attract true patriots, but they're also a political vehicle for those who flavor that patriotism with xenophobia. Nationalism is authoritarian. It turns easily towards autocracy, or at worst, outright dictatorship. Nationalists hide their threat. They hide it under an exaggerated love of country, an unthinking patriotism, my country, right or wrong. Its leaders view other countries and sometimes other races as inferior. Nationalism is suspicious of foreigners. It accuses immigrants of stealing jobs or in some other way undermining the indigenous population. This has been so for hundreds of years. It's often wrong. And let it be said in this house of God, unchristian. There is an immense divide between nationalism and patriotism. Patriotism is more than a pride in country. A mature patriotism concerns itself with the condition of the people as well as the prestige of the nation. Such a patriotism worries about deprivation, about opportunity, and about incentive. And it asks itself, how can we spread our wealth and opportunity more evenly around our country? And it's as concerned with the growth of food banks as it is with any shortage of aircraft carriers. I fear for these broad, socially liberal attitudes. 
the financial crisis of 2007 and onwards, led to less security, low or no growth, and rising taxes. And that has created public dissatisfaction with the old, albeit fallible, politics. Anger about its shortcomings replaces cool, dispassionate judgment about its performance. Despair gives a credibility to promises of easy solutions when, in truth, there are none. Our social and economic liberalism may be fallible, but it's not some mishmash of woolly-headed do-gooders. It protects individual liberties and human rights. It promotes market freedoms, ownership of property, and freedom of movement. And we dare not take these values so familiar to us, we dare not take these values for granted. We need to celebrate them, protect them, and practice them. Politics must not become a playground for demagogues. Capitalism and free trade, in my view, are bulwarks of democracy. They have lifted untold millions of the poorest people in the world out of abject poverty. As trade has grown, wealth has grown. As wealth has grown, money has been spent, literacy has risen, and fatal diseases have been eradicated. But free trade is under attack. When growth was buoyant, all was well. But after the financial crash, many workers around the world see global trade as a threat. They are told to see it as a threat. And many companies exposed to foreign competition feel the same way. Now these are genuine problems in some respect. There are problems there that have to be dealt with. Globalism has been a force for good, but it has distributed its gains very unevenly. Individuals have gained wealth that Croesus would have envied. Global companies have driven out competitors and become mega rich. To protect itself, capitalism must be ethical. And if it is not, then opposition to it will grow. So business must confront malpractice and eliminate it. Capitalism must reform itself, or government must do it for it. Anything goes capitalism is not acceptable. It can only damage free trade and open markets and encourage protectionism, less trade, slower growth, and as a result, greater poverty. If that happens, everyone loses, but those with least will lose most. Our British democracy around the world is seen as honest, not corrupt, free, not repressive. Our legal system is widely admired and respected. Our elections are acknowledged as fair, not fixed. And governments leave and enter office without violence and within a few days. Our parliament has been a democratic model. As a nation, we can and should be proud of all this. And I am. But I will come to the buts in a moment. Let me say first, I've never been among that minority of Britons who disparage our country and always side with its critics. I am, and I always will be, proud to be British. But having seen our democracy at work over many years from the inside and from the last 16 years from the outside as a reasonably informed observer, not all is as it could be or should be. We can do better. Our present parliament faces an extraordinary range of complex problems. Brexit, an historic blunder in my own view, though it's not my theme for this evening, will consume the time of this parliament and crowd out domestic issues 
that are crying out for action and have done for a long time. It would be better, but it cannot be, but it would be better were Parliament free to focus its attention on health, on social care, on housing, on education, on transport and on deprivation. But until Brexit has been resolved, which may take years, few if any of these subjects will get the full attention that they merit. Nor will constitutional issues over Scotland or Northern Ireland or the social problems of income disparity and the North-South divide, which surely cannot be permitted to continue as it is. All of these, each of them vital to the well-being of our country, will be secondary to the fallout from last year's referendum. On the day I entered Downing Street, 27 years ago, I set out an ambition to produce a country at ease with itself. For a raft of reasons, I failed in that, and no one has subsequently succeeded. But that objective is as important today as it was when I set it out over a quarter of a century ago. Let me now turn to that list of buts that I mentioned. To cynics, the words service and duty are old fashioned, yet they're virtues that deserve praise, not scorn. To a very large extent, our public service embodies them. The civil service is a fundamental engine of our democracy. It has an historic memory, which protects against the errors of the past being repeated. It's politically independent. It brings balance to our system of government. And yet, and yet, in the last 20 years, it has been undermined by its own masters. When things have gone wrong, a small number of ministers, against all past practice, have blamed the civil service for the failure and not themselves. Political advisers have undermined civil servants and usurped their role. The Freedom of Information Act has hampered the dispassionate advice offered to ministers because in due course it will be published and the civil servants are not public figures in the sense that their views are expected to be made public. Ministers may decide policy, but the civil service must deliver it. And to do so, it trawls for ideas, delves deep into potential pitfalls, advises, cautions, and prepares legislation. It is very much in our national interest that public service should remain a career that attracts some of the very best brains in our country. We should value it not disparage it. And I hope, I hope that government will rethink some recent practice on special advisers. Ministers have a right to non-civil service advice. But as advisers are paid from the public purse, they should, I believe, be men and women of experience and ability. Many are, but not all. Their role needs refining. Good special advisers with expertise and political nous can make for better government and better liaison with the civil service. But over the years, a handful of advisers have acquired unjustified power that they have misused. At times, they have driven wedges between ministers and their civil servants. Some have been used as attack dogs on both their, political their master's political opponents and their master's political colleagues. The culprits were often protected by ministers when they should have been dismissed without ceremony. Some advisers with intellect but little judgment are easy prey for the media. They are flattered, whined and dined. And the naive among them talk unguardedly, while the more unscrupulous leak stories, perhaps under orders, that create feuds between senior ministers and complicate policy. This is not what special advisers are appointed for. 
Any that behave in this fashion should go. A one leak and you're out policy would be a worthwhile discipline for the Prime Minister to institute across all government departments. It is a strength of our democracy that debate on policy is fierce. That is as it should be. Policy affects people's lives. Passions can rise, and sometimes it's right that they do so. But policy disagreement is not only across the floor of Parliament. Too often, members of the same party are seen as opponents, not, not one of us to echo an unfortunate phrase from the 1980s. And this leads to rival camps being formed. And these factions, opposing wings of the same party, fight one another more vigorously than they do their opponents. This is potentially destructive of the party system, which is the main operating structure of our democracy. The old political adage my opponents are opposite, my enemies are behind. I think I'm safe this evening. <laughs> my opponents are opposite, my enemies are behind, is currently apt for both our main parties. And there's a reason for this. The anti-European right wished to control the Conservative Party. The neo-Marxist left wished to dominate the Labour Party. Both are making headway in a battle for the soul of their respective political parties. And these ideological battles have dangers for our democracy. The rebellious radicals of right and left argue for partisan policies that appeal to the extremes of their party base. And as they do so, political divisions widen, consensus shrinks, and a minority of the party begins to manipulate the majority. This is dangerous territory. The malcontents would be wise to remember that without some give and take, without some effort at consensus, our tolerant party system can become ungovernable. In politics, as in life, consensus is wise, not weak, and tolerance is a virtue not a failing. If fringes begin to dominate a political party, I believe the middle ground of their support will turn away in disgust and the shrillest voices and the most extreme views will begin to dominate debate. Where that risk arises, Democrats should worry. Indeed, they should do more than worry they should fight back. Politics has always been a rough trade. It arouses strong feelings and plain speaking, which sometimes can turn into abuse. A hard-boiled professional will say, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, maybe. But the language and tone of politics matters. It can enthuse or repel. It can excite or deflate. It can uplift or it can cast down. Clarify or confuse. It can examine the truth or ignore it. In the 1930s, Oswald Mosley used his oratory to stir up violence. During World War II, Churchill, in Ed Murrow's memorable phrase, mobilized the English language and sent it to war. In the 1960s, the conservative Enoch Powell inflamed opinion on immigration and the Dockers marched in his support. Oratory can change public opinion for good or for ill. And today we need it to explain increasingly complex policy in a way that is readily understood. The world is different today from the way it was. It's decayed since the popular press fully reported speeches in Parliament. The speeches may have been dry, even dull. 
but perhaps by osmosis, osmosis, policy was understood. But it's more difficult now. Today's world is more complex. Policy is more complex. And today's media world is much more complex. We can't expect the written press to act as a public service. It's losing readership and fighting for its very existence. In its struggle for survival, it favours sensation because sensation is more likely to sell newspapers. This entertains, but it may not necessarily inform. Many political stories, you will all have read them, are spiced up by informed sources. This is often self-interested, malicious comment and should be read with many a pinch of salt on the side. It may excite and intrigue, but it rarely leaves people very much wiser. Television news is more informative, but not always so. Often interviews are brief and confrontational and focused on securing a headline for the next news bulletin. Political news programmes have longer interviews and can be a better source of information, but they too often slip into confrontation. And in each of the above charades, the electorate is left perhaps confused and almost certainly uninformed. We can't only blame the media. Spin and soundbite were political inventions. They replaced argument with meaningless phrases. Labour's tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, and the Conservatives take back control serve as memorable examples of pitch-perfect absurdity. They convey nothing, they explain nothing, and they are worth nothing. And they can mislead. As I have discovered, I once used a phrase, back to basics, and it was taken up, <laughs> was taken up to pervert a thoroughly worthwhile social policy and persuaded people it was about something quite different. And the low point was reached when politicians were offered a daily form of words by their parties to be trotted out in every interview. This is not only undignified, it's self-defeating. As voters hear our elected representatives uttering puerile slogans instead of explaining policy, it is no wonder, is it, if respect melts away. Slogans and sound bites are a deceit Electors deserve the truth in plain English, not in fairy tales. When trust in our elected representative falls, democracy fails. Now there are, I concede, rare occasions, rare occasions, when public interest demands, I think the expression is, that you are economical with the truth. But in the main, clarity and honesty really is the best policy. And by honesty, I mean more than simply straight talking. I mean honesty in facing up to challenges, honesty in acknowledging fears and dangers and difficulties, honesty in action, honesty in admitting there are limitations to what any government can do. Honesty can be very politically inconvenient, but less so than concealing the truth. Honesty commands respect. Slogans don't, sound bites don't, spin certainly doesn't. Honesty is essential in a functioning democracy. It's infuriating to listen to interviews where every question is sidestepped or answered with obfuscation. Such conduct treats the electorate with contempt and no one should be surprised if they return the compliment. I don't wish to be prissy about this and appear to suggest that was some past mythical age in which everything was perfect. If there was, I've never heard of it. I was certainly never part of it. But politicians can do better to serve the electorate. And I think at this moment, it would be a very good idea for them to do so. The essence of our democracy is one man, one vote. But except in the ballot box, no democracy in truth offers equal influence
to every citizen. Anthony Trollope, honoured here in Poet's Corner, wrote in his biography of Cicero, and I quote, the power of voting was common to all citizens, but the power of influencing the electors had passed into the hands of the rich. Now that was, of course, two millennia ago in ancient Rome. But the same power of influencing, not remotely to the same extent, but the same power of influencing lingers on in some modern democracies. The very rich, if they assert themselves, may be able to influence government. In America, and I speak as someone who is one quarter American, so I think I'm entitled to say what I think about America. In America, big money perverts the system. The sheer cost of their elections, with most of it spent on advertisements attacking their opponents, is enormous. A member of Congress seeking election every two years is perpetually fundraising. No wonder they don't have passports and don't go abroad. Even if donors ask nothing in return for their generosity, it is likely to be in the mind of the politician as he or she considers policy, and it ought not to be. In the UK, we are luckier. Money is far less damaging to our system, but it still manifests itself through party funding. Party funding is an acute dilemma. All political parties must raise money to campaign, to run their organisations, to pay their staff, and none can hope to fund this through membership subscriptions alone. There are only two ways to fund the balance, and neither is attractive. At present, the bulk of funding is by wealthy individuals, business, and the trades unions. This is bound to give rise to obligations whether sought or not sought by the donor, and is intrinsically unhealthy. In my experience, many donors are altruistic and give money simply because they wish to support the party of their choice. But some may seek to exact a price. Whether that price is a policy promise, an appointment or an honour, it is undesirable. An alternative is more funding through the public purse. This would be deeply unpopular with the electorate, and I share the general distaste for it. Nonetheless, democratically, it may be the least bad option. A compromise might be more state funding than at present, but in return, a legal limit on donations from individuals or business or trades unions a legal limit that should be set at a level where nobody could subsequently reasonably argue that it influences policy or buys reward. Such a scheme isn't perfect, it's certainly unpopular, but on balance, I believe it would be beneficial for our democratic system. Here tonight, in this magnificent and hallowed place, we are surrounded by the spirits of many historical figures who were elected over the ages to represent us. Over many centuries, many generations, through times of strife and turmoil, times of uncertainty and change, through times of national crisis and times of celebration. They are commemorated here for the service that they gave in their lifetime to our nation. Whatever their political beliefs, they were all elected by the people to serve the people, and it was the people who had the power to dismiss them. As a boy, I read what Edmund Burke said, and let me quote him. To deliver an opinion is the right of all men, that of constituents is a weighty and respectable opinion, which a representative always ought to rejoice to hear, and which he ought always seriously to consider. He went on, but authoritative instructions, mandates issued, in which the member is bound blindly and implicitly to obey, to vote and to argue for, 
though contrary to his clearest conviction of his judgment and conscience, these are things utterly unknown to the laws of this land and which arise from a fundamental mistake of the whole order and tenor of our Constitution. I agree with that Burke quote without qualification. As that young boy across the river 60 odd years ago, I would never have anticipated that the weight of that responsibility would ever fall upon my own shoulders. It was a privilege, but a burden too, as it is for all who bear it. And all must ask themselves, did I do what I believed to be right? Did I speak up and not be afraid to speak the truth? We are blessed to live in this land, but each and every one of us has a responsibility, a responsibility to keep democracy alive and fresh and kicking and never stifle free speech or freedom of action provided it is within the law. Earlier, I spoke of my soapbox in Brixton and the tolerance that was shown to me in the salad days of my young political life by many who could quite reasonably have taken a very different view to mine. I do not like what you say, said Voltaire, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Indeed so, that is the responsibility of democracy. Now is the time for some questions. There are two people around with, with roving mics, uh, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions and lots of reactions to, to what Sir John has said. I'm going to ask one first. I'm fascinated by the thought that it was about 18, 850 years from the conquest until we really got full democracy here. And I'm not sure, looking around the world, that democracy is necessarily going to get itself embedded in some nations uh, quite soon. I mean, clearly we got some particular experience in Iraq of hoping that democracy would, would flourish and finding it not quite so. So what is, what is the, the, the global story? You talked about it retreating in some parts. Uh, do you have hopes, expectations that democracy will ultimately be the manner of government, of, of rule in every nation? Well, before I come directly to that question about uh, democracy in 850 years, um, let me say I'm happy to answer any questions you like. You can ask them any way you like, and I will answer them any way I wish. <laughs> um, I think there is a difficulty here. You mentioned it has taken 850 years for us to develop our democracy. Hands up all those who think our democracy is perfect. Exactly. After 850 years, it isn't. So the belief that we can pick up our democracy and transplant it into other countries where they have no historical instinct for democracy, where they have a different culture, is fatuous. It isn't going to happen. People will build up to, to their own form of democracy in their own way, but it is arrogant of us to think that we can artificially transplant our democracy to other countries. If they seek our help, we can offer it. If, we, if they seek our help, we can provide them with the background to how our democracy works, with how you need a civil service, with what the trappings of democracy are and what its practice should actually be. But for us to try and implant it elsewhere is a mistake. Will it grow in other countries? I think over time it will because in the example I gave earlier, when a country is very poor, if a government comes along of whatever nature and begins to improve the quality of life for those people, they are grateful. 
But as they put human nature never stays grateful forever. Church hasn't worked that out yet. <laughs> human nature never stays grateful forever. And as people become more self-dependent and better off, they demand more. And in countries where there isn't freedom of choice and freedom of action, that is what they are likely to demand. So it will build up in countries over time. I think there will be more. And I think uh, uh, Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And I don't think that phrase will ever be bettered in that sense. So yes, but it will be self-perpetuating. It will not be inflicted upon people by us. Thank you very much. So there's one here, and uh, there are a couple there. So, so someone on the middle row there. Perhaps, Chris, you go there. Alex, you come down here. Hi. I first wanted to thank you for your very inspiring speech. Six years ago, in 1958, Harold Macmillan, he made this speech called Wind of Change, in which he announced the end of colonization. So do you think, six years on, we're going through another, a new wind of change? And if yes, how would you describe this new wind of change that we're going through? Thank you. And then another one just there. Yep. Sir John, as a statesman who has contributed so much towards the establishment of peace and democratic processes in Northern Ireland, do you think that the problems which may flow from Brexit in the wake of Brexit may present particular problems in that area. Yeah. Let me take the questions as they were asked. Macmillan's Winds of Change speech was not much remarked on in South Africa when he made it. It was only later that people realised what he said. Now, I'm cautious about talking about Macmillan because sitting in the front row is Professor Hennessy, who has forgotten more about Harold Macmillan than anybody in this room will ever know. <laughs> so I am extremely cautious uh, about that. Um, his wind of change speech presaged a good degree of decolonisation. We don't have any colonies uh, of any significance uh, to lose. But we are living through a time of unprecedented change. There are winds of change of all sorts. If anybody had asked us three years ago, who would have forecast what has happened in America, in Britain, in Europe, or in many other parts of the world that has happened over the last two or three years? Change is accelerating. Not only change in politics, but change in every sphere of our life. Some of this change is very good. There are many people who are alive today because of the changes in medicine that have been extraordinary over the last 10 or 20 years. The changes in science, which are changing many of the ways in which we live. There are going to be changes in robotics and artificial intelligence, which will alter the future world of work. And as a result of that, will alter the nature of education because we are going to have to educate our young generations to be equipped for the world of work. So it's not a wind of change in one area that we're getting. We are getting a hurricane of change from almost every side. And it is very bewildering. It's very bewildering because change moves faster than politics possibly can do. I don't think there has ever been a time in which, it, in peacetime, where it has been more difficult to be a politician than it is at the present moment because of the sheer scale of change and the sheer difficulty of coping with the public demand for an instant response. We live in a world of instant demands and the expectation of an instant response to those demands and that can't always be done. So the change is quite extraordinary and dramatic. Let me turn to Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland in 1990, when the peace process began, was a very different place from Northern Ireland after the negotiations, after the signing of the Easter Agreement. It was not only different within Northern Ireland, it was different on the island of Ireland. The relationship between North and South is better than it has been at any time since partition. And the relationship between Dublin and London 
has been better in the last few years than it has been at any time in the long history of the United Kingdom and Ireland. And if we get a border between Northern Ireland and the South, it is going to disrupt a great deal the aim of the European Union and of the Northern Irish government and of the British government is to minimize any disruption and everybody is prepared to work together to that end. But it is very difficult to see how we can avoid a border of some sort. And the sheer scale of trade that goes from south to north is extraordinary. There's over 200 billion pounds worth of trade coming from Ireland to the UK every day. There are about 2,000 lorries that would go across the checkpoints every day. There are all sorts of foodstuffs that couldn't be dealt with electronically. They have to be physically examined as they, as they come through. There are a whole series of things made in the Republic of Ireland. For example, Guinness is made in the Republic that transported to Belfast where it is bottled. And a whole series of other things. And there are many people in the North and in the South who make things out of a whole range of different components, part of which are in the North, part of which are in the South, and they're going backwards and forwards like a yo-yo, picking them up. It is going to be extraordinarily difficult. And I very much hope we may be able to find a way of, uh, of, of avoiding a border. You could, of course, do it if you stayed in the customs union. That would avoid the border. You could do it if you stayed in the single market in the customs union. That too would avoid it. But if you don't, there is going to be a border. And the question will be, how frictionless is it possible to make that border? Free movement of people, I'll be one second, free movement of people between the Republic and the UK, we can deal with. That's not a difficult problem. Free movement of goods is much more complex. So, John, I don't want to take you away from some of these really big issues if you want to pick them up, particularly with somebody else, but I wanted to ask you about the habits that feed into political culture, because you did touch upon that in your lecture. I did a piece of work more than 20 years ago on something called the Nasaland State of Emergency in the Devlin Report. Uh, that was in Macmillan's time. He managed to persuade the chairman of that uh, commission of inquiry to skip a executive summary, something your own government did with the Scott uh, inquiry. But it struck me at that time, uh, looking at that particular uh, report, 1959, that there was more parliamentary coverage and more detailed parliamentary coverage in the Daily Express in 1959 than there was in the Daily Telegraph in 1995. So there's a big shift in political habits and political discourse between those two dates. Now, I think you yourself indicated there's no way of, of going back, but is, do you see any cause for optimism in terms of the, those habits that feed a political culture that help, that help make the health of a political system? Bear in mind that even Hansard at one time was a voluntary thing that was resisted by the political class. And the lady over there. Hi. So um, in 2015, I stood as Labour, Labour's parliamentary candidate in my home constituency of Tunbridge and Morling, which for those who don't know is one of the safest Conservative seats in the country. Um, and the experience made me acutely aware of the ways in which first past the post is undermining the quality of our democracy. I had people on the doorstep saying, this is the first time I've been canvassed for 40 years and I've lived here all my life. Um, people saying, I'd love to vote for Labour or the Liberal Democrats, but in this neck of the woods, is it really worth it? Is now the time for proportional representation? Uh -huh. <laughs> Gosh, that's a tough one. Um, let me deal with the first question. Uh, you're quite right about the weight of... Uh, practical detail politics in the, in, the, in the press. It's a different world, and I touched on that when I was uh, speaking. It's an oddity, isn't it? We have more media than we've ever had before. We have social media on a scale no one dreamed of in 1959, or even probably in 1989, and yet is dominated by other things rather than the practical information that helps people make up their mind about politics. Um, but it's not just the media. 
the, ma the mass membership of the political parties is different now. The Labour Party have just had a great influx of young people at the time of the last general election, though I understand from my friends in the Labour Party that some of them are now disappearing. But the membership of, of the large political parties used to be a mass membership, and it is no longer. And that is not just the failings of the political parties. There wasn't nearly so much to do in 1959 as there was in uh, uh, nine, uh, 2015. There are many people of my acquaintance who would never have married had it not been for the political parties in 1959. It is a different world. So I'm not sure how you correct that. But it is why I think you do, we do need to take seriously how we disseminate fact, not political oratory, but cold, hard fact about what the implications are of the legislation that we pass. And I don't know of any easy solution. One of the advantages of no longer being in politics is I don't have to pretend there is an answer to every problem. <laughs> there isn't. And if there is an answer to this one, I'm afraid I don't know it. Um, the, the proportional representation. There is an argument for, for, for proportional representation. And um, were I a liberal, I would undoubtedly advocate it very strongly. There is a disadvantage with it as well that we have to weigh carefully. And that is the fact, if you look across Europe, where are you going to find, well, take Germany, the strongest economy, the largest and most important economic and political nation in Europe. And yet it has just had an election in which a large number of people of very extreme views have got into their parliament precisely because of the proportional representation system. There are, I think, 93 members of the Alternative for Deutschland, the extreme far right. And then on the extreme left, uh, you have Die Link, who have, I'm not sure, 40, 50, 60 seats. And that is going to complicate policy for Germany, which affects all Europe extremely, uh, uh, to a very extreme extent. Now, there are many deficiencies with first past the post. I don't deny that for a single second. But I think we have to choose between which set of deficiencies we want. Some of the things that have happened in the last century, some of the advantages brought forward by both parties, might not have happened if they didn't have a clear majority in the House of Commons. And so you have to weigh that certainty of being able to deliver policy against the democratic desirability of everybody being able to vote and all sorts of opinions being represented. There isn't a consensus on it, and I very much doubt there ever would be. I don't dismiss the case for proportional representation, but I'm not especially attracted to it for that reason and only that reason. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you referred in your opening to the fact that uh, inaccuracies and sometimes falsehoods have uh, featured on the political landscape in recent years. Um, to what extent do you think um, that accountability has uh, featured in our democracy in the last decade? Do you think we've had enough? Um, and if not, any suggestions how to, as to how it might be uh, made a more prominent feature? Sir John, um, you talked about the risk of easy sound bites and puerile slogans. Um, I was just wondering, bearing in mind you said you don't necessarily come up with all the answers anymore, but where and how do you think we should start being more honest? And perhaps significantly, who do you think should start with that honesty? <laughs> um, accountability for people telling porkies is very difficult to uh, counter um, unless it is pointed out publicly and repeatedly that what someone has said is untrue. Now, that would be quite an occupation from time to time for someone to do. But I do think it's important when things are said that are blatantly untrue. There are some things where it's a matter of opinion and fair enough. People have different opinions. But there are some things where it is just plain factually wrong. And I've been, very, I've been very pleased, for example, to see the Office of National Statistics, for example, say publicly that certain statements are wrong. 
And I think we must encourage public bodies and the government to do that. It's within the memory of a number of the parliamentarians who I see scattered around here, that if you actually lied to the House of Commons, you would cease to be a minister and you might even cease to be a member. Now, maybe we took that too far because people made a mistake rather than lied, but it's not a bad idea to have a sanction for people who deliberately mislead in public life. And I would like that sanction to be public opinion and a clear acknowledgement by people who are in a position to know the truth, a public acknowledgement that what has been said is wrong. And I hope that might begin to change the habits of the minority of people, and it is a small minority of people, who actually deliberately falsify. People can make mistakes, and they often do, but I don't think there are a vast number who deliberately falsify, but there certainly are some. Um, Sound bites and puerile slogans. Well, I suppose if you find people who are existing on sound bites and puerile slogans, one sanction would be not to vote for them. Um, another sanction would be, if you are in their constituency, to actually go and see them and say, what does this mean? Why are you saying this? It is absolutely meaningless. I want to know what Clause 71 of the Dustbins Bill really means, and you're not telling me. I only think, I, I can see no way, unless people are confronted with that, unless there is a general demand, a, a general drift towards much clearer exposition of what is actually happening, then this is going to continue. And that's why I raised it. I hope there will be. I, uh, in, the 19, in the 2015 election, I spoke at a very large number of marginal seats. And many of the young men and women I spoke for were elected. I have to say, I thought they were the best intake that uh, I had seen since 1979 to take an intake <laughs> purely at random. And I think that is very encouraging. Many of them are very, of very high ability. And I don't make that just as a conservative point. It is equally true of the Labour Party. Many of the young people who came into Parliament in the 2000, I don't know so much about the 2017 people, the 2015 people were very high quality. So maybe there is some hope. All things are fads and fashions. Uh, spin, soundbite and slogans have been a fad and fashion. It may be they will fade, I hope so. But where not, we should confront the people. I'm sorry that's, there's no silver bullet to solve that problem. I can think of no other way of doing it than that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's a very fine note, I think, on which to, to conclude. Uh, w whether Sir John has been completely honest in saying that he's given up politics when he's going around the country, uh, you know, supporting the election of politicians, I'm not sure. And of course, once a politician, I think always a politician, we've, we've heard a, a wise politician reflecting on his own experience. Uh, and uh, we're immensely grateful as well for the, for the little provocations and suggestions of improvements. Uh, Sir John, we're immensely grateful to you for the time you've given us and for your, for your wisdom and, uh, and for the breadth of the discussion you've opened up for us. It could go on for a much longer period, but it must finish now. So thank you very much indeed.